Speaking of evil geniuses, they've had an interesting week. Uh, I'm sure if you are subscribed to the Substack, which you absolutely should be, you will have seen uh, some of my reporting about evil geniuses. It's never going to stop with those guys. It's never going to end I, it, in, until the org ends. Because I was, like, checking in. Uh, back in, I think it was April. It might have been March. can't remember. It was it was very early on when I started the Substack. So, you know, left the Serto in February, March time. And uh, anyway, what I, I was, what I always do is every so often I'll go into my Pacer account and I will run the names of esports companies to see if there are any lawsuits going on. It's just something I do regularly. I don't know why no other journalist does it. It's the easiest thing in the world to do. Uh, all journalists should be, you know, keeping an eye on these things because there's so many legal issues going on uh, in the background uh, in esports because there's so many grifters, you know. And anyway, so I was running the name Evil Geniuses because I'd heard that maybe they'd had legal action taken against them by a former staff member. And in there, I saw that they were already in a legal dispute and had been since 2021, I believe, with Sumail, the fucking Dota 2 prodigy. And it relates to when Peak 6 came in, uh, he had uh, equity in the company in 2019. When they took over, they basically changed the type of his shares. This is a broad simplification of what happened. And also, this is in, according to his legal filing. So we'll know uh, later on how true all of this is. But anyway, they, they he, he states, his legal counsel states, they changed his shares to be like just common stock, which means you basically go down the peck in order. You don't have preferred stock. And so you are less likely to get, you know, dividends or, you know, in a, in a result of a bankruptcy, you're less likely to get, you know, value from sold assets and stuff like this. So... I dip back into the documents, right? And I put this report out on September 11th. This is the news that that trial, it's going to go to a jury, it looks like. Because when I looked at the filings again and saw the update, there had been the standard sort of fuckery uh, that was going on that basically... Samael wanted to call some witnesses. Evil geniuses didn't want that to happen, saying they haven't got enough time to prepare and the witnesses were being called late. The judge sort of stymied that. And now it's been agreed upon that not only will it go to a jury trial, they've agreed a list of witnesses as well. And the witnesses is like a who's who of esports, particularly Dota esports. All these people would be called as witnesses in the result it does proceed to trial and the and the date has been set and we're not a million miles away from it but anyway so i'll just pick you up i mean this is like it's crazy because very often these cases don't get this far somebody settles a lot of lawsuits it's a game of chicken you know the first thing that the lawyers agree upon from both sides is let's stall this and so they get paid and you, and then it's just who like bleeds out first or who blinks first. But anyway, this is uh, the report. It says that Sumail's complaint revolved around what happened to his equity and evil geniuses at the time of the brand's acquirement by the Peak Six Strategic Capital Group. At that time, Hassan stock was converted into 265. Uh, 1,338 units of common stock and 106,667 units of restricted common stock. His counsel's lawsuit alleges that at this time, no one but Peak 6 members received preferred units of stock, which grant the owners superior rights to common stock, such as higher dividend payments and more robust claims to assets in case of liquidation. A further allegation in the suit states that no one from the Peak 6 group explained the nature of these changes as the merger took place. These occurrences, among others listed in the filings, were characterized as breach of contract and fraud and deceit. 
Another key aspect of the lawsuit involves Hassan's departure from the organization. In November 2019, Hassan was then presented with a mutual release clause that would free him from any remaining contractual obligations. The suit alleges that this mutual termination agreement jeopardized his ownership stake within EG. They say that it imposed harsh, unwarranted, and draconian obligations and forfeitures that later in the suit they deem to be unconscionable. They also state that the agreement contained numerous irregularities, discrepancies and inconsistencies, as well as a number of ambiguous and or unenforceable terms and conditions, and sought to use the imbalance of bargaining power in a bid to force Hassan to forfeit his stock. So there's a lot going on there. I've read all the legal documents, obviously. So just a few things, not a lawyer, but... What I will say is I've seen a lot of these cases now, and I know for a fact that the unconscionability standard, i.e. that a clause in a contract or an in, a contract in its entirety is, you know, unconscionable in terms of getting the party to agree to it. It's a very high standard to meet in court. Very high standard indeed. Whether or not that would happen here, there would likely need to be something nefarious going on from EG. Now, in addition to the legal filings, if you go into the docket, there's a ton of other stuff there. And ultimately, what EG, EG is saying, that claim should be dismissed because Sumail was an adult when he signed the contract, this uh, mutual release clause, that he had already uh, agreed to play for another team, which was against that agreement and i think the other thing was that he was told by nicola point jameson herself that he needs to consult a lawyer before signing anything which they say is obviously you know enough that they have handled their end of the business and been responsible so that's the back and forth there's a lot of this case that sort of relies upon will they be able to show in court that ultimately the terms were unfair but unfair to such a degree they were unconscionable and that Hassan himself didn't receive the correct advice, wasn't advised to consult a lawyer and was ultimately pressured into signing the contract to get on with his career. Signing the contract, of course, means he would essentially forfeit his equity in EG, which EG argue they had to do because Valve and all these other leagues say players can't have ownership stakes in teams they don't play for. Which is interesting because I've never seen that enforced anywhere in recent years. I haven't seen that enforced since E-League. So that's kind of interesting, but whatever. So a high, a high bar, but uh, on it goes. Since then, it's been a busy summer for the two respective legal teams. As is expected ahead of any trial, several witnesses have been approached for deposition testimony. Uh, by the same token, the Evil Genius's legal team attempted to exclude any late disclosed witnesses, but this request was denied. Although it's not clear whether or not the depositions have been entirely completed at this time, the witness list is submitted includes a number of familiar names, including past Evil Genius's management, staff and players. And uh, Philip Aram, of the LCS Players Union has been put on the list. PPD has been put on the list. Obviously, he's at Nouns now. I think he left as, I think he left in 2017. So I don't know why he, his name's down. Universe, the player. Fear, the player. The legend, Arteezy. Crit. And Nicole herself. Uh, will be called as a witness in this because she handled the negotiations. So it's like really, and, and there's uh, there's other names, there's like other people. That's not a comprehensive list by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, they're probably the most famous people, if you like. But um, it's it's interesting because yeah, as I said, the 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 likelihood is they've already been deposed and uh, they will be brought for questioning. They've even already worked out how long people will be examined and cross-examined for questioned and cross-examined uh and that's in the that's in the document as well so it does look like i mean everyone's really thought about it going ahead i think eg don't have any interest in settling this at this time evil geniuses made a number of requests for admission so this was interesting there was like another document where eg's lawyers were saying to sumail Will you just admit these things? And they would put a question, and then his lawyer would say, in almost every case, they would either deny it or say, we cannot admit or deny 
because, quote, the terms used are ambiguous, uh, uh, sorry, vague, ambiguous, and therefore overly broad. And that phrase was just repeated throughout it. So, for example, the first question in the list, I think, is, you know, will you admit that Nicola Point Jameson advised you to consult an attorney before signing anything? And then they deny it and said, the term advised and consult are vague, ambiguous, and therefore overly broad. Uh, and so it was just like this. Uh, it's so It was so sort of crazy, like, seeing it just constant denials uh, uh, and, uh, over everything. Like, nothing, no, no, no territory given at all uh, for the argument. So it does look like it's going ahead. I've been reaching out to find out a bit more about it. What's also interesting is there's a 90-page document, which is for jury instructions, and it explains loads of stuff about esports it explains loads of stuff about you know the specifics of the industry and things you've got to got to know it's fascinating to sort of read how they have to explain what esports is and how an esports org functions and blah 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 so yeah i, I went i went through and i've read all the documents with the court case uh, as it says in the report, the trial is set for the 6th of November this year. So again, we're just round the corner. But this isn't the only thing evil geniuses have been embroiled in. As I reported today, you probably saw the initial uh, tweet that came out. Uh, but basically, there's a, a reporter. I think his gamer name is Purist. He's a guy called Max Cat, And he tweeted out that, well, their Valorant team that had just won a world championship, e.g. Um, has told their starting roster they can explore options. If they do stay with the org, though, they would have to accept a significant pay cut. Now, there's a lot of misinformation, just first of all, around the salaries. I don't know where this has come from, but a lot of people settled on the number $25,000 a month. E the e.g. players aren't getting that. I don't want to say the specifics in case it gives something away about who i may or may not have talked to or anything like that but it's not twenty five thousand; it's sub twenty thousand. so the uh, the idea that uh they're being paid like 25k and it was like a massive overpayment for where the industry's at that's not accurate but anyway I, when i when i heard this story was doing the rounds uh i wanted to do some digging into it because it's eg and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna rest until all the people who've been fucked over by EG at least feel that the org has sort of been held accountable in some way. And you know, I've poked fun at some of their players like Ethan and uh, you know, things like that. But ultimately what's gone on here is is ridiculous because they got told on September the eleventh or thereabouts, even though they just won world championships less than three weeks prior to that. Uh, they were going to have to take a pay cut. And the pay cut was going to be almost 50%. And so I was like, that's, that, you know, nah. <laughs> like, come on, guys, for fuck's sake. It, it, this just isn't out. Now, there's been this trend in Valorant Esports where people are panicking because they all, the classic North American team ownership, they went all in. They paid money for players. They paid money they didn't have to to get players they didn't need. And then they turned around to those players and they said, hey, will you take a pay cut? It's now pretty much common knowledge. This is what happened with Cloud9 and the Yay breakup. Everybody knows it in the scene. I know Jack at the end did a video and he was saying it was role issues. What was to blame, wasn't it? And everyone was like, yes, role issues. The bottom line is they basically fucking turned around and said, listen, like we need you're just going to have to take the salary cut. I know we have a legally binding contract that says we're going to pay you this amount. But the other thing you have to know about these American contracts is a lot of these contracts have termination clauses in so they can fire you with cause. So, um, you know, if they can if they can essentially, you know, construct a reason to get you out, they just they can. It's not like. You know, these are not incredible, like, robust contracts or whatever. So I'm like, fuck this, because they were... What was wild was, actually, before I even look at my report, what was wild 
was I saw people saying the most outrageous shit. Quite possibly the worst opinion I've ever seen expressed about an organization wanting to break a contract they already have in place by cutting a salary agreement they have in place. By the way, those contracts, they were, they run until like midway through 2024. That's publicly available information. This is from uh, Bo Hoogland, who is now a team manager, but I think he used to masquerade as a journalist or some shit. I don't know. He, he, this is his take. It clearly shows the players don't respect the evil geniuses if they are not willing to take a pay cut. Most players, at least from my experience, wouldn't be against taking a pay cut if the organization has a good working environment. Players get treated fairly and actually show appreciation to their players for their success. So, in other words, what you're supposed to accept is when you sign a contract... Remember, there's a lot of talk in the industry about, oh, players need to respect the contracts that they sign. You've heard that one a lot down the years, right? Well, why do orgs think they can just turn around and say, sorry, we've got to cut your salary in half? Or, we because we can't afford you. We fucked up and we, ma we made a deal with you that we can't afford to honour, so you take the hit. No, nah, that's bullshit. That is absolute bullshit. So, no, let me tell you. If you've just won a world championship, your value's high. If anything, you should be asking for a pay rise. That's how the world works. That's how sports works. I have never heard of, let's say, like, in, in NFL or NBA or Premier League football. Right. I just scored 40 fucking goals for you, and we just won the Premier League title, and we're in the Champions League, and we're getting all that fucking financial windfall. I got two years left on my contract. I want another deal. And the person goes, uh, your person in charge of the team goes, uh, well, listen, we're going to have less sponsor money. Yeah, we're going to get that Champions League scratch, but big sponsors pulling out next year. We were actually hoping you'd take a pay cut. That player's gone. They go. Like what what is this? Now you now you're pissing in my face. Fuck this. They're out. Goodbye. Right? So just a nonsense take that, you know, if anything. And, and the worst part is the organization, if you remember, they're all spiking the football when they won the world championship and dancing around. Look at us, we did it, we finally did it. Our stupid fucked up ways of constructing an esports team, which has failed in every other team that we've constructed using these methods, it worked this time, and we won the worlds, so now it works, they're the proof. So you then turn around to the proof of your entire business model, your proclaimed proof that your business model works, and you turn around and then say, but you've got to take a pay cut, though, because actually we might have slightly overvalued the market, and we're not doing anything for, like, until February next year, so, you know, we, we're sort of keeping you around, so you, you should, should do us a favour, actually. No, fuck that. That's fucking insane. So that's 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 just a, one of the worst opinions I think I've ever heard. And the fact like he's a team manager, I don't know, mate. Maybe maybe that's not it. Uh, but anyway, we can go back to the report now. So beleaguered North American esports organization, Evil Geniuses, have found themselves embroiled in another dispute with their players. Weird how it keeps happening, isn't it? Weird how this one org keeps having all these issues with their players. I don't know. Makes me really makes me think. This time in Valorant. Sources close to the players and management have informed this publication that the organization told its players around September the 11th they would have to cut their existing salary in order to keep them at the organization. The existing contracts weren't set to expire until 2024, making the duration of the reduced salary substantial. A source familiar with the negotiations explained that the proposed pay cut was nearly half of the original number, with an increase in the percentage of in-game cosmetic sales to offset. And by the way, spoiler, there's shit coming down the pipe about that too. Because, as I said, on my to-do desk of stories, now that I'm a one-man newsroom, out of the next five I'm working on, three of them are with EG. <laughs> like, it's it's a joke, guys, how badly run this org is. It, it, it stinks to high heaven. And, you know, keep in mind, by November, you've still got the jury trial to look forward to. So, it, it, it's like, basically, it's like, Oh, we'll do nip for a bit. Nip, nip, nip. E.G., 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 E.G. Bit of nip, bit of E.G. 
Back to talking about Saudi. No one listens. No one cares. That's basically my workflow at the moment. And then there's like, uh, I've got a couple of other stories relating to some more interesting stuff. I'm even working on a story about Twitter at the moment. I got my, I'm, I'm, I've got a very, very full plate. The, uh, the all you can eat buffet of esports, you might say. Anyway, right back to this. So fifty percent, but to offset it, they're going to give them more of the sales of the in-game cosmetics, which is lucrative. But probably it's not guaranteed and not to the same degree as having the, the salary. As the players are under no legal obligation to accept a reduction in salary, Evil Geniuses have allowed players to explore their options as first reported by Max Katz. This, however, might not be as benevolent a move as it first appears. The sources who contacted this publication stated that the organization may still elect to ask for buyouts for each of the players, potentially as a tactic to ensure they don't find suitable teams ahead of the Valorant season. The moves are time-sensitive as the transfer window for Valorant players has started already, one of the sources explained. This means EG could wait, ask for buyouts, and block the players moving, basically. Then if the players don't want to accept the pay cut, they could even terminate them without clause. EG have a franchise spot, so they have... See, without clause, I meant to say earlier. EG have a franchise spot, so they have a lot of leverage to force players to stay if they had blocked their opportunities elsewhere. So let's take a look at the shell game, right? You have this winning fucking team, right? And you've, you've finally done it. You've finally developed the talent. They're all great. They don't even come to you and ask for a pay rise, even though they're world champions. And you just hit them out of the blue and say, we need you to take a pay cut now. Something that must have been apparent, by the way, weeks, if not months ago, which they withheld from the team because, you know, they thought it might demoralize them going into a tournament. So they wait until there's no tournaments to play in. And right now, everyone in Valorant is constructing their team. Everyone in Valorant has pretty much already gone out and got the team they want or signing the players they want. There's a bit of roster mania going on in Valorant, right? I'm sure you've seen all the stupid tweets because all the American players are fucking insufferable saying, I'm joining this org and I'm joining this org when they're not joining this org because they have utter disdain ultimately for the, for the, the media apparatus around the industry that makes them wealthy. So that's fine. You waste everyone's time like that. But... It's, it's real, it's going on, there are moves, and so, obviously, this means if the players want to get in and about it, they need to do it now. If the players want to get the bag and get more money, or get a move to a good team, maybe even get a move as a unit, or at least keep the majority of it in place, they need to be active now, and EG have said, well, okay, go on then. But, with the proviso... That even though there's no specific buyout clause in the contracts in general, because they're still technically under contract, even though if EG tried to force a pay cut on them, I'm sure the players could legally argue a material breach. They, they right now, as they are paying the agreed salary and the contracts are in good standing, they can turn around and demand a buyout. And the buyout can be whatever EG say. I know a lot of people have trouble understanding kind of this but just because you don't have a buyout clause when you're a player doesn't mean the org can't elect to sell your contract now you can go through there's all types of arbitration and all types of shit with this i've covered this down the years so i'm pretty you know savvy with these things a general agreement is you know a nominal fee for the player and then essentially what the the remainder of the value of the contract gives you an approximate value that would be deemed reasonable to pay but what these players even though nothing's happening till next year, people want to build their rosters now, and then they want to be practicing, and they want to hit the ground running when BCT, Champions, all that shit starts up again. So, people want to do it now. They're doing it now. Now is the time. So, the players have to, out of nowhere, in September, barely had time to wipe the taste of champagne out their mouths, and now having to think about, what team do I want to play in? Where do I want to go? Can I go there? Is there room there? Blah, blah, and, and they haven't to think about that so it's already a nightmare for them and their agents and then any organization that might be interested in the eg players they have to put they have to propose a buyout that where they're not overpaying it's enough to pique eg's interest right so they're already off kilter in a negotiation eg are holding all the cards 
And then EG can just not accept any of the buyouts and say to the players, ah, the buyouts just weren't good enough. Sorry. Listen, I know there's nowhere for you to go, and we're a franchise team in the league. Does that pay cut look a little bit better now? And so the players are like, well, the choice now is essentially leave EG and play nowhere or play at EG for approximately 50% less. So this is the issue that the players are facing. And it's fucking, it's, it's just a garbage way to treat players. Remember, these are world champion champions. These are like their best team. No other team is coming close to doing what they're doing anywhere in the open. And meanwhile, by the way, get this. One of the stories I'm writing about, how's this for a banger? Right, a little a little teaser of things to come. You know the blueprint, their famous CSGO blueprint? You know how they all fucking were jerking off about that, right? I'm sure you do. Well, you know what? That 15-man blueprint, get this. That only came into existence because ESL were going to kick them out of Pro League. Right? This is true. ESL were like, we've had enough of you finishing last. You're stinking up the joint. Even the other teams don't think you offer value anymore. We're going to have to have a meeting and decide whether you can stay in Pro League. And so EG was super worried that maybe they were going to get cut, right? And so they said, we need to come up with an idea, a branding. So ESL have a reason to keep us in. And they all went away and they all did a brainstorm. And they came up with, hang on a minute, we, we've got this one. Why don't we pick up 15 like mediocre NA players, <laughs> right? And remember, ESL sold those Pro League slots and hurt NA in doing so. And so we say to ESL in the meeting, we are going to be the saviors of NA this, when you fucked up NA, so you should really keep us in or you're double hurt in NA. That's the gist. And so they went into that meeting with ESL, about to get kicked out the Louvre agreement, showed them, this is what we're going to do, we're calling it the blueprint, blah, blah, blah. And ESL went, yeah, fine, go on then. You can stay in the league. So they've publicly put that out there as like, this is some insane, you know, gigabrain scouting and talent development plan, when in actuality it was born out of necessity to fucking stay in the league. So... That's coming. That's coming down the pipe. Uh, but anyway, back to this. So, if you're if you're one of the Valorant players at, uh, at at EG right now, then you're absolutely like you're you're fucked. They have to find at short notice a move to a big team. Sadly, as an individual, it's very similar to what happened with the guard that we talked about. You know, suddenly the prospect of being able to stay together as a team might very well be off the table. You've got to relearn the synergy. You might not be able to play the roles you like, you know, the characters you like. You might not work with an IGL you vibe with. You've got to take on all of that. Then you've got to do it in a small window to try and get out from under this. And EG can still stop you, essentially. So... Uh, I'll, I'll read uh, just read the rest of the report. Just a few more paragraphs. The players themselves haven't confirmed the reports, uh, but public posts on X.com. Uh, it's weird seeing X.com. I always think of fucking, you know, like, gonna go get some aliens, which, by the way, you all saw what was going on with them little mummified ones. Lots of aliens. Uh, lots of alien talk today. But anyway, Ethan wrote, I miss old esports, where if you were good, you were on a good team where there was something to grind for, and if you did it successfully, you got to reap the benefits, where winning was everything. Uh, now, listen, <laughs> when I first saw that tweet on the day, I nearly did a quote tweet saying, says CSGO player that left struggling CS team to make fortune in Valorant. But <laughs> that would have been shit of me. That's old Richard would have done that. I'm trying not to do that so much. Right? It's not, especially because I knew there was some fuckery going on behind the scenes, and anyone who's been at EG is having a tough time. Right? So, anyway. Then, his colleague, Bustio, wrote simply, Wow, just fucking wow. So, I think it's safe to say something's going on, guys. <laughs> uh, I then point out the hypocrisy, uh, which is um, 
The dealings will come as a slap in the face to the players who had only won Valorant Champions 2023 last month. That victory was heavily promoted by the organisation as proof their non-traditional methodology works, and the players were heralded by the organisation as pretty special in a video made after the event. That was the Gamer.Doc video you were all linking me to. Thanks for that. Uh, departing CEO Nicole LaPointe Jameson also pointed to the victory in her letter to the community. It took only close to two weeks as world champions in the lengthy off-season for the organisation to propose the players take a pay cut yada 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 everyone's doing pay cuts in valorant uh you have sentinels cloud nine and then it just ends with some links to the riot games investigation number one of my exposés on the website and the lawsuit with samail and of course and we'll get this in the video there's a lot of rumors right now there are two rumors going around about evil geniuses and when i understand when i hear rumors i'm hearing pretty good rumors these aren't your common or garden rumours. These are your, you know, these are good rumours. These are high quality rumours. So a lot of talk about them selling the LCS slot. But interestingly enough, that then sort of snowballs into, but they're selling the LCS slot as part of a buyout for the whole org. Uh, a lot of people are saying, indeed, see, Chicken Nugget Uwu knows it's the word on the street. The word on the street is that they are talking to that Fosun group that Chinese entity that owns Wolves, and they are basically trying to get them to take over the, uh, their share of the business enough to have a controlling stake. So EG would be their problem, essentially. So not to be confused with the Forson Group, right, or the Horson Group. So that's what that's what they're saying. So I, I think I think that is potential, and I agree with Odie in the chat. I would really like, uh, if this brand is for sale at a discount, let's say, once they've strip-mined it of all of its assets, uh, why not why, why not get Alex Garfield involved again? Be, I mean, he's been back lately. I know he took some time off with some health problems, but he could hire some good people, run the org, get it back to the glory days. But who knows? But, yeah, the whole thing... And EG right now has just been a total farce. And the EG, the, the, the sorry, the Valorant players at EG, that they're the latest in a long line of players that are finding out that not everything is it seems over there. I've also noticed as well, like every time I like check my feed, someone from EG seems to have left. It just seems to be like hemorrhaging staff. Like people are just leaving. And they're not even saying where they're going. They're just saying goodbye. They're just leaving. So, I don't know. Seems seems to me uh, that I if I was a betting man, I, I think EG is either about to sell and Peak 6 are going to do like a, a hard exit. I think. Seems inevitable at this point, given all the negative press. Ah, and thanks, uh, Fusion. 34 month streaks and says... Um, I want. Uh, I was used to be a big fan of EG, and I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for doing this investigative journalism. It's sad. It's like I said on the previous uh, stream and pro the previous YouTube video. If you're watching this in the future, I really wanted Nicole to be different. I really wanted Peak Six to to understand that. Yeah, okay. There's lots of room to improve in esports, and maybe they have some nominally good ideas, and let's try them. But it just can't be at the expense of people's well-being, and it can't be at the expense of people's quality of life. And and that that's been the that's the problem. Like in, in esports, we're still a very young industry, and I mean that quite literally in the sense that our workforce, our, our fan base, our players, they're all young. You know, you talk to 24, 25-year-old vice presidents in this business and no one blinks an eye. And there's not a lot of the older, wiser heads that that have the experience and the kind of, you know, backbone you need to stand up to these external forces that come in and want to control uh, esports. E and so, unfortunately, when you come in with a ruthless corporate streak and you say, like... You know, I just need this to be fucking done. Get it fucking done. And you talk to people like shit and you bully people and you don't appreciate that in esports, 
it's just a different pace of life. People are still feeling it out. People are very under-socialized in general in esports. You won't find many esports workers who had a job outside of esports before esports. The bulk of the boots on the ground esports workers are teenagers that love video games, that want to work in an industry they give a shit about instead of having a soulless fucking job in a cubicle answering calls. That's that's what our workforce is. If you come in and you go fucking Glen Gregory Glenn fucking Ross and just screaming at fucking people and fucking telling them this has to be done, it has to be done my way and it has to be done to the maximum levels of competency or you're fucking fired and you're doing an Alan Sugar bit. It's 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 wrong. It's just wrong, unfortunately. It's not, this isn't the space for that. And people aren't going to tolerate that. And you're not going to get results, ultimately. And I don't know how many more times we're going to have to learn this lesson. And I don't know how many more young people are going to get chewed up and used by this industry. And I'm, I am tired of seeing the very human cost of this industry. I've said it before. I'll say it again. I will not let these orgs come and do this. Because even though... I have my own reason for detesting esports fans. I'm going to I'm going to also say unequivocally that the people that make this industry, the the ultimately the young athletes who are incredibly talented at video games, they need to be treated l- like what they are, which is young, undersocialized, often vulnerable adults that are suddenly hurled into a spotlight with a very immature audience. And you cannot put those people in positions where they're going to fail or be under pressure or, you know, be in, like, not get the support they need. Because, you know, look, I don't want to make it dark right at the end of the stream, but the reality is we've got a lot of mental health issues that are going unnoticed, unresolved. We've had a lot of influencer and esports suicides in the past couple of years. And this is the problem, you know, that like these types of people come from corporate America and they think these young vulnerable adults are going to be able to just cope with all the demands and all the pressure and deliver performance consistently. Like they've not got anything else going on in their lives. And that's just an unreasonable expectation. And that's as true for the players as it is for a lot of the creative types in the industry too. And and trust me, you don't hear their stories. You don't really hear about the creative types in the industry that get used and chewed up. The graphic designers, the documentary makers, you know, the, the people who come up with all the memes, the community managers. You don't hear about their stories, but they get used by this industry too, and they get mistreated by this industry too, and they end up on the fucking scrap heap. Like, they did something wrong, but they didn't. And yeah, I'm just tired of it. Like, every the, the only thing and I'm really writing about now, you will notice, is either failure of duty of care or sports washing. That's it. They're the they're the they're the two big battlefields where I need to be. So that's where I'm gonna be for the rest of this year. I wish more people would be there with me. <laughs> it would be super nice, but some some fights you fight mostly on your own.